Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Ah, some like magic. It's great to hear the hum of the crowd. I'm so glad that so many folks came out this evening. I uh, really appreciate you taking time out of your night to, to come and hear this fabulous talk. Uh, and so that you know, there we have about 300 people registered to listen to this um, from feasibly around the world this evening via live stream as well. Uh, so we're really excited to have everyone here this evening, both in person and online. Um, I'll start off by saying some of you probably got the message, maybe some didn't, that unfortunately Tom Hubka is not able to be with us here in person this evening, um, but through the magic of technology, he will still be sharing this fabulous presentation with us virtually from his home uh, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and as we, we think we have all of the technology worked out, but if there's a moment or two of technical difficulty, ask you to bear with us um, if, if something crops up. But knock on wood, it will be very good to go and very grateful for the folks at Next Stage for their help in making all of this technologically possible. And we will have an opportunity at the end to ask questions of, of Tom as well. Um, this is being recorded uh, as well for our website. Uh, it will be live on our website um, in the future as well, so just so folks know that this is, is being recorded. Um, so I am Jeremy Ebersole. I'm the public outreach manager for the Landmark Trust USA, uh, and we have our executive director, Susan McMahon, here as well. Uh, and we're very excited to have all of you here. I'm just going to talk a little bit before, um, before we uh, get into Tom's presentation about our organization, who we are, what we do. Um, some of you may be very familiar with us, some of us, some of you not so much. Um, we are a historic preservation nonprofit um, based right next door in Dummerston, Vermont, uh, and our mission right here on the screen to preserve and restore historic properties through creative and sustainable uses for public enjoyment, education, and inspiration. And we do that in a number of ways, um, both through, um, uh, through programs like this uh, and by these five or six, excuse me, five historic houses uh, and Scott Farm, our heirloom apple orchard um, that we manage. Um, the five houses are, uh, are primarily rented out as overnight uh, accommodations uh, that you can stay in or for small, small gatherings and provides a really amazing opportunity for folks to live uh, within a historic place uh, for a few days and experience that history firsthand um, in a really special way, uh, and then using the resources there to help continue to preserve those buildings and make sure that they, they stay alive um, long term. Um, the, the properties, just real briefly to, to review the, the properties that we do manage, we have Nalaka, some of you may be familiar with Nalaka, Rudyard Kipling's home uh, where he lived in the late 1800s for just about four years, wrote The Jungle Book and a number of his other um, works that led to his Nobel Prize in literature a few years later. Um, we also have right next door Kipling's Carriage House, uh, a two bedroom property that was the home of uh, Kipling's coachman. Uh, and then right around the corner, we have the Sugar House, a converted um, 1915 Sugar House that's now a one-bedroom unit. Um, and then right behind Scott Farms Apple Orchard, we have the Dutton Farmhouse, a uh, four-bedroom um, property with an amazing view over the Apple Orchard. Uh, and then out in Whitingham, Vermont, um, just by the Massachusetts border, we have the Amos Brown House, a three-bedroom um, property that's really beautiful uh, and remote and great for really just getting away from it all. So we manage these five properties um, as overnight rentals um, as a way to, to preserve them and give people the experience of being in those properties and encourage you to, to check them out. Um, we also have events. Um, oh, goodness, and now... I'm not, I'm not advancing, so let me see here how we can advance this slide. There we go. That's the only technical difficulty of the whole night, I promise. The, uh, 
We have an event, uh, along with this uh, educational events like these, um, we actually have our largest fundraiser of the year coming up uh, in less than a month, that is the Nalaka Estate and Rhododendron Tour, and we have a new cocktail party option um, this year, and that will be at the Nalaka Estate on June 2nd and 3rd, uh, always the first Sunday and Monday in June, um, an opportunity to, to come and enjoy the properties. It's the only time of the year when they're really open to the public in, in this way, um, and tickets are selling fast, so I encourage you to visit um, the website uh, and get your tickets there if you want to experience these places um, in that way um, coming up soon. Um, now, as I mentioned, we are a nonprofit organization, and so as a nonprofit, uh, of course, we we are happy that you are here and happy for your help. If you like um, this event, uh, like the work that we're doing, I encourage you to consider supporting us, and there's a number of different ways that you can do that. Um, the overnight rental income from our properties um, helps us to, to keep the, to maintain the properties, but we depend on support, donations, grants, uh, and the like to help support education programs like this or larger capital projects on the properties. So a number of ways that you can support that work, of course, visit our website, um, follow us on social media, sign up for our email list to stay in the know with what we have going on. Um, and of course, if you'd like to leave a donation, we'd certainly be grateful. You can do that um, through the link on the QR code. We do have uh, a donation jar downstairs. Um, and we can also purchase um, Tom's book, Big House, Little House, Back House Barn, directly from us. Uh, we have three of them left downstairs. They have also been selling like hotcakes. So if you didn't get one, come down quickly afterwards, uh, and if you don't get one today, give us your name and we can, we can get one for you um, in, the, in the not too distant future, and that's a way, again, to make uh, some of that money would then come directly to, to support our work. Um, and then, of course, come to the Rhododendron Tour as our, as our big fundraiser of the year. And so, with that, I'm excited to introduce uh, the real reason you're all here this evening, to hear from Thomas Hubka. Uh, to talk about his book, Big House, Little House, Back House, Barn. I want to first thank, uh, of course, Next Stage for hosting us this evening, uh, both here in person and the technology to make this all possible. We're very grateful to Next Stage for their support, um, and also to Vermont Humanities, who supported this event um, as well. And uh, this, this program is put on thanks to their help as well. So Tom Hubka uh, is a professor emeritus from the Department of Architecture at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where he taught for over 20 years. Professor Hubka's presentation tonight is going to focus on the historical development of New England's farm architecture, with special call-outs to local properties and our own Amos Brown House. Professor Hubka is best known for this very book, for which he received the Abbott Lowell Cummings Award for the best book in American vernacular architecture. He has written his writing, uh, excuse me, he has recently received awards for his latest book about American popular housing, How Working Class Home, How the Working Class Home Became Modern, 1900 to 1940, from the University of Minnesota Press. Hubka has also received awards for his book about Polish wooden synagogues, titled Resplendent Synagogue, Synagogue Architecture and Worship in an 18th Century Polish Community, from the University Press of New England. He currently lives in Portland, Oregon, where he is involved with architectural history courses at the University of Oregon, Portland State University, and Portland Community College. He returns each summer to his family's connected farm in Bridgeton, Maine. And finally, before I turn it over to Tom, I'll mention that Tom did um, provide some of these fabulous drawings to anyone here in the audience. Uh, so we do have some of these printed out downstairs, um, complimentary, and encourage you to stop down at the desk um, before you leave to pick one of these up. And if, if we run out downstairs, there are more actually on the way to, uh, to our office and encourage you to, to we can swing by um, uh, to Scott Farm where we are and pick, pick those up and we can give you more details downstairs. So with that, I will turn it over to Tom and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen uh, and we'll have a moment of transition and then Tom will be right up.
a historic preservation cons consultant. Um, and she took me on a tour of Putney uh, area through her writing. Um, and she's so knowledgeable about your your farming history. And so uh, the little I know about the Putney farms uh, comes from her research. And I, I acknowledge that. And I doesn't mean that I know a whole lot about Putney uh, areas, but uh, I've kicked off a couple um, factoids uh, from from her. Um, the reason I'm here is because I, I, I wrote a book. Uh, this is the second cover. Uh, I, I designed this one as opposed to the, the, the first one on the 20th anniversary. Um, uh, some people have uh, uh, children, and um, uh, I have books. And so this is Junior. Uh, and Junior's been out there for 40 years and uh, 50, 000, over 50,000. Um, uh, just not too bad for a farm book. Um, uh, and I'm pretty proud of uh, my <laughs> my little one. Um, and I, I, I'm here to tell you uh, about uh, the research and, and uh, from this book. Big house, little house, back house, barn. Uh, uh, these are the words that describe the architecture that I'm talking about. And it comes from a children's rhyme, um, uh, as far as we know, uh, 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 recited um, at the turn of the century, uh, 120 years ago at least. Um, and when I started my research, well, 50 years ago, a long time ago, um, after a while, I, I talked uh, to uh, Grange Halls, um, uh, the place to talk about to talk to farmers um, uh, uh, 40, uh, 45 years ago at, at this time. And I would ask um, as, at some point, I, I'd ask the audience, have any of you here um, heard about the uh, heard the expression big house, little house, back house, barn? Um, and um few uh people uh, usually the women in the back of the room would would raise their hands and say yes uh well, we've heard it and through interviews with uh, uh, these women um would be uh, uh children around the turn of the century uh, uh at the time that, that i talked to them and they said they they recited this uh, in childhood games but the most popular one was a childhood game um that is a little uh like um uh where are you going to get married? Then we're going to find out where you get married. Are you going to get married in the big house, the little house, the back house, or the barn? Now, some of you, if you're Vermonters or, or not from away, um, you know perhaps where this is going. Um, do you want to get married in the big house, the front house? Well, some there are some marriages there and, and uh, occurs uh, over time. So presumably that's where you want to get married. The little house, married in the kitchen? Well, not so, not so nice, but... Married, if you land on the barn with the animals, but, and here's the humor, if uh, the childhood humor here, what if you land on the back house and get married in the back house? The fall, the fall. Well, that's where the five holer is or the two holer or whatever ever you have here. And you can see the childhood logic there about uh, the, the big house, little house, back house, barn. And, and you can see the girls, maybe like in Kenny Bunk here, uh, uh, a beautiful picture of, of girls, perhaps I'm reciting Big House, Little House, uh, uh, Back House Barn as they as they twirl, twirl around there. Um, it is a childhood expression, and it's the only expression that I would say is an indigenous local expression for describing these buildings. Um, academics like me, um, I have, I've labeled it uh, the connected farm buildings of northern New England. That's an academic way of doing it. Um, the childhood uh, um, ditty uh, that is recited there actually gets at the heart of the issue. There are four parts. They recur over and over again. And kids, and this is kid logic, hitting it right on the nail. Um, uh, they do a good job of this. And so I'm going to try to tell you about the logic of these buildings and, and describe um, uh, how they came about and, and what do they mean. I hope. Um, I have hundreds and hundreds of pictures. I'd love to show them all. Um, but if you're really from away, I mean, uh, uh, also, I, I, I don't, I, I've only lectured a few times in, in Vermont. I have many, many other times in Maine and New Hampshire and, and Massachusetts. Um, so I'm, I'm not so keyed in uh, there. So I don't have so many pictures of, of Vermont farms. But in, in any case, um, the pictures on the screen show you a variety of connected farms. So what you want to think that is happening here is there is a front house and there's a line of buildings and it's connected to the barn. 
connected point. Okay, over and over again. And look at the, look at the pictures. It comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. And this is the way that farmers orchestrated and were architects of their individual farms by organizing their building in this in this similar um, understructure. If you want to think about that pattern uh, of building. So how come? I started 50 years ago now um, uh, uh, looking at these buildings and, and I'm an architect and I'm curious about buildings. So that just comes with it with with the turf. Um, and so I started to measure these buildings and, and photograph them and, and all that. And as I did that over a 10 year period or so, I, you know, I, I knew a lot about them. Uh, I'm, I'm reasonably intelligent, but not that great. Uh, but I couldn't figure out uh, how I couldn't get an old connected barn. In other words, I couldn't get a farm that had certainly an old house. This is um, uh, 1805 or something like that. But I, the rest of the buildings were in 1805, and that happened over and over again. In other words, I couldn't get all the pieces of the connected farm uh, uh, built at, a, at an early date. Now, presumably, if the literature suggested at the time that this probably came over from England and it percolated a while, perhaps in the colonies or something like that, and it, 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 the farmers, local farmers develop it and all that. Presumably, I couldn't get that. I, I just it just I couldn't get an old connected farm. Gradually, I found evidence like the one below here. And so here's a picture of the same farm. This is the Nevers Bennett farm in um, Sweden, Maine. And here we see um, a picture, a photo of the same group of buildings. But these are other barns. And uh, through research, I know that these barns are disconnected from the house. So what I found was that there are many connected farms, but earlier versions of the same farm. They weren't connected. What's going on? Am I missing something? Perhaps, perhaps. But what I, what I found out was that um, over and over again, there was a stage in the development of many or most uh, uh, connected farms. There are farms in, in New England, actually. There's an early pioneer stage, but even know about the initial log cabin or early structure and, and a barn of some kind, and it's built together. And they added to it. And then they connect. And that's the sequence. And so here's the Never Bennett, Never's Bennett Farm and it's their sequence. So between 1860 to 1890, uh, the Bennett's made this connected farm. How come? Why, why during, that, during that period? And it kept uh, recurring in this late 19th century period. Um, so my thesis. If you're a professor, you have to have a thesis, you know, you have a big, the big idea. And the big idea here is that between about 1850 to 1900, farmers in northern New England made connected farms. That's a 50-year threshold. 50 years, all connected farms are built, except one or two or something like that. Wow. Um, that's my thesis here. I'm going to try to prove that to you and all that. And it may not seem logical, and some of you know that, but that's what I'll try to do. So. Here we go. Now, as a professor, you usually talk about big movements. And so uh, this is a, the agrarian movement of New England. That's all I'm, I'm you know, speculating about that. So I'm doing here. And I could, could be just movements like industrialism or Bolshevism or whatever. Those are isms. Behind isms are real people. And so what I, as a humanist, I hope, uh, a historian, I got to put real people behind this. I have to somehow figure out, here's the Never, Never's Bennett farm, how these guys did this to this farm. And what, here's Charles and Charlotte Bennett, um, and they got married in by just before the Civil War. And here's what they did. They modernized a, l a little bit of the inside of their um, older federal style house over here. They dismantled the older kitchen L and made a more continuous, larger uh, kitchen L over here. They dragged the stable that was out in a little more out here, right into line with the house. They disassembled, they took down the earlier barns and they reassembled a barn from three miles away and, and they put it together. And by, by 1880 or so, they made a disconnected farm. Now, why did they do that? 
Uh, that's a reasonable question. Uh, that that's a lot of work. Uh, I, I might add for anybody. There are more than average farmers here, but still, it, it, it's a big big time. I tell this to my students. You know, they're, you know, they're pretty smart and all that. And I I say to them with a little wink in the eye, I say, but they don't look like farmers. You know, I, you know, I could be I could be pulling your leg, and, and they kind of go, mm -hmm. you could be, and all that. But here's Charles and Bennett, uh, Charles and Charlotte. And they probably uh, they lived in uh, uh, near. This is the uh, the main uh, New Hampshire line uh, near Freiburg. Maybe they went to the drugstore in Freiburg and got photographed here. Okay, are they farmers? I ask you, the audience, to look at Charles. Okay, and I'm saying, what about him makes you think he's a farmer? My students, so they're all from, they're no farmers. My students, and so they look and say, well, I don't know, he's got good clothes on or something like that. Any of you out there? Want to say why you think he's a farmer? Take a look. Here's a hand. Here's, here's Charles's hand. Here's an architect's hand. Okay. Okay. It's really white and it's soft and you know, whatever. You ever shake a hand with a real farmer? I've done that sometimes. I, I've looked down. I thought he had a glove on. No, it, it's his. It's his skin. It's beaten. It's swollen. There's Charles Swollen's hand. You work in machinery for 50, 60 years. You do rock walls for most days of, of your life during that time and get your hand busted. You've got a swollen hand. That's what you got. He's a farmer. These guys made this farm. So why they do it? Okay. That's my question to you. You didn't think this was going to be a quiz, but it's I'm a professor, and so now you're in the class, and so that's what's going on. Why? Why did Northern New England farmers connect their houses and their barns? Well, just as God made green apples, right? That's a main, that's a expression that I've heard over and over from farmers and all that. Well, here's the answer, right? And I'll elaborate on the answers. During the, the heavy snows of, of really severe New England winters, Vermont winters, if you want to think about that, wise Vermont farmers connected their houses and their barns together to afford passage between the house to the barn so they wouldn't you know, freeze to death or whatever or that sort of thing is, right? Now, remember, it's right for most of us. Remember, most of us are city folks, and I ask you city folks, and I know there might be some, a couple of real farmers in the audience and all that, but you would want to do that, wouldn't you? Seems logical. It's a slam dunk, okay? This story has been told for over 100 years. Uh, uh, in, in New England, and uh, why wouldn't it be right? Well, so I, I don't think it's right. And so I know professors, you got to watch out because they, they tend to well, know it all, or at least I don't think it's right. I think it only tells a very small proportion of the answer, and there's a whole lot of answers that are far more convincing about that. So you're skeptical, you know, uh, there's a Vermont skepticism, uh, there's a kind of wise old, you know, rural uh, skepticism about professors, uh, for example, which is correct. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll try to tell you. Uh, so let's go on and let's 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 look at the facts. If I can try to do that, the first factoid uh, that you want to understand is that this is the limits of connected farms in the universe. Okay, so here's Maine, and it goes through the center of Maine or something like that, up into a little bit of Canada, and down the spine of, of the Green Mountains. This is important for you guys here. On the western slopes, going down to Champlain and the Hudson Valley, not many ever, ever or a little bit connected farms. So you're on the periphery of that. But it's just so, it's in New England here. Now, uh, scholars like uh, Wilbur Zielinski, a geographer, and a lot of other scholars have done this, including myself, and so this is, this is true. <laughs> Some of you might be surprised about that. You know, if it was such a good idea or so popular, and it was so popular in New England, why didn't it spread? New England puts its stamp on architecture throughout architecture throughout the entire country. Ohio is a little bit of New England, <laughs> and so is Illinois and things like that. But they didn't have connected farms, and they never did. How come? Was it colder in New England? The farmers in New England, were they? did they get colder? Okay, let's be careful. So there's another thing that and even more important about that. Out of Vermont and other parts of New England, 
settlers streamed out at, starting about 1810, 1820 or, or so, and they go west. Lots of people go west over there. And here's a farmer from Vermont who went to the Genesee Valley near Buffalo, okay? And he builds a farm, but it wasn't a connected farm. And no settler leaving Vermont before 1850 or so built a connected farm anywhere else in America. Now that's unusual because farmers usually build their, in a new settled place like they built in the old place. German farmers that come from Germany, well, they build in Pennsylvania and you know in Ohio and German barns, right? Okay, right. But they didn't do that here. So how come? Okay, so let's. Uh, so I don't think it's snow, but but we'll have to we'll have to think about that. So uh, being a professor, you have to have a thesis. So here's my thesis. Okay, in a 50 year period between 1850 really to 1900, 95 percent or almost all connected farms are built. That's a 50 year threshold. How come? Did it suddenly get colder? You've heard of 18, 1816 and froze to death. The, it, it occurs throughout a brutal winters in New England. That's earlier. I've studied the weather charts of, the, of going through this. The, uh, it didn't suddenly get colder in New England in the late 19th century when these were built. So uh, but weather is, 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 is it's a little dicey here about if that's the main reason they built connected farms or even a reason they built connected farms. Okay, so we're gonna, I'll try to prove that. So we'll go back here and so big house, little house, back house, barn, big house, little house, back house, barn. Now, four parts, I'm gonna go through each of the four parts and analyze them separately and talk about their contribution to how they developed the connected farms uh, and how it made sense with all these four, four component parts. So you take it apart and put it together. First, the big house. Um, if you're from away, this is the, the house closest, usually closest to the road, the bigger one, the house with the architectural style on it and all that. So that's the front house of the connected farm, farm complex. There's a change and a big change between previous houses before connected farms and after. The, the early stage most of you know about, here's uh, one of uh, New England, uh, America's most popular house, the Cape Cod house, a standard medieval, comes from England, house built um, in America, built in big, big numbers here in Vermont and other places um, uh, before connected farms, before 1800 or, or so. So the two things you want to know about this, it has heavy timber construction, big, thick, uh, medieval um, uh, uh, timbers uh, uh, for their for their structural members. And it has it has stove, uh, sorry, it has fireplaces. And here's your big fireplace chimney in the center, center chimney house. Cape Cod house. This house and the construction techniques, medieval construction techniques that is used, was good enough in, a, in New England for 200 years until it started to change to another kind of house built after about 1820 or 30, late or into the 19th, uh, late 19th century. Uh, we don't have a name for this house. Uh, guys like me call it a side hall. When you open this door here, there's a staircase going up and there's a stair hall there side hall house. It's a modern house in many ways. It has a balloon frame construction. More than that, it has stoves. So when you see a, a small chimney like this, this is a stove chimney. It goes down to a stove. So here's the, the fireplaces from the center of the, this house to a change to a stove um, a chimney um, and lifestyle uh, with a stove um, in houses, houses like that. Big change. Part of my thesis is modernization. That's what's going on here. These guys are modernizing, well, even though it doesn't look that way uh, somehow from the outside. So a connect, change to connected farms, a change in the big house, uh, the dominant big house uh, uh, as shown here. Little house. So this is the second house. The, the little house is the kitchen. The kitchen is the center of the farm on a disconnected farm, connected farm, a house in uh, Indonesia, a, Farm in Indonesia is still the kitchen is the center of life. Here, here's the way that it goes. In New England, houses that previously had a kitchen in the center of the big house moved the kitchen to a detached kitchen L. The word L is not used throughout the United States. I go around the United States talking about this, but it's used in New England. So kitchen L is almost like a, a common word, and, and we use it all the time here. 
So it could you could start out with a small house like this, but then you add a bigger house and then you convert this little house to a kitchen. By 1840, Vermonters and anywhere else in New England built a house with a kitchen L, and it has a big house and a little house as a standard component of, of the of the, the two-part system. You can see it's working toward the connected farm architecture here. So that, that's going on, uh, occurs all over um, in every kind of housing, urban and rural, uh, th throughout New England, the kitchen L. We can romanticize about the kitchen L. You can look at Curry Arrives kind of pictures here, bus hustle and bustle and, and romantic uh, uh, Thanksgivings, I guess, or something like that. Or you can more realistically say it's a pretty uh, tough walk to the pump over here uh, by a farm wife here with a kitchen L over here. But anyway, it's all, uh, it's uh, the, the kitchen L. But inside the kitchen L, they modernized. And they and that's what's happening in the connected farm organization. The adoption of that is also modernization, even though it doesn't look like that. But on the inside, what they were doing was they were adopted the stove. In Vermont and other places in New England, between 1820 to 1850, 60, they went for stoves. You got from Vermont manufacturers, a lot of big ones in, in Vermont making stoves. So anyway, they're going there in the 19th century and the connected farms, they're putting stoves in. Look at this picture of, of an, a reformed kitchen. Look back here, do you see this? What's what's that? What's in back of the stove? That's a fireplace, okay? It's, it's covered in, okay? And a stove is put in front of it. Hundreds of thousands of times this happened in New England. There's a pump over here, perhaps from a... a, a uh, a storage of a, a, a tank in, in the basement uh, 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 in some ways. Uh, they had hydraulic jam, uh, uh, rams, windmills later on. The wife, the, the in-house worker, uh, gets pumped water at some point. Here's linoleum on the floor. You can smile about linoleum. My students do. Um, uh, it sounds old and all that. But for a farmhouse kitchen, one sheet of linoleum, Meant, meant that you could finally clean the floor that was uncleanable by early 19th century standards. Anyway, reform, this is part of uh, uh, what's going on inside the antique looking connected farm and why they adopted it. Here's a picture that tells the story about the little house kitchen. It's a good story here. So I like it because, um, and I asked my students here and you, why is she smiling? Now, look closely. Okay. Now, it isn't a big toothy grin um, like a selfie kind of picture. You know, it's none of that here. This is New England. Okay. And, or maybe from, I know this is actually uh, New Hampshire someplace, I think. And so, where is she? Okay. Well, she's in, in the parlor, right? Here's the parlor stove. It's a kind of uh, a Victorian cliche in some ways, but it, it, it's, she's warm. And what else is happening here? So, what, what is this? Follow my arrow here. What's that? What's what am what, what am I tracing? Okay, in unison, the the fireplace. Okay, do you see that fireplace? But the better, the more important aspect of this that you want to know is it's a fireplace to what room? What room? What room is this, or what was the fireplace built for? It's covered over fireplace over here, the kitchen. And because, because it's a big fireplace, usually has an oven in one end or something like that, it's a kitchen fireplace. I don't know this story, but hundreds of thousands of times, this room that used to be a kitchen is converted to a you know, parlor or something like that, or a bedroom. And the kitchen goes into the L over and over again. That's happening, that happening in New England uh, for the older pre-1820 um, uh, type of house. Common story, common story of the country farm. Back house, little house, big house, back house, barn. The back house is harder to describe. It's sometimes one building, as we see here. It can it can absorb the kitchen in within this long building. It's it's like a, a little house and back house here. Here's the Hupka farm um, in um, uh, Bridgeton, Maine. Uh, the Hupka settlers came in uh, 1969 over 70 or so. So they're not original, but they have two buildings uh, in, of the back houses. So th it's various. I'm going to tell you about the back house and its importance in the connected farm in conclusion. So we're going to hold that one uh, a little there, but this is the third, the third building in the complex. The fourth building, 
Little House, Big House, Back House, Barn. The barn is in some ways the simplest uh, build, building because it has the, uh, the, the at least the out, out, uh, the outer form of that, the simplest to understand in the transition. Here's an early New England barn. It's called an English barn. And we know what we call an English barn because it has the door in the side or eave end of the barn. This is about a five bay barn or so uh, over here. It's a long one, but they're, they're shorter usually. For 200 years in, in New England, after the Puritans landed in 1620, this barn was good enough and built over and over by everyone, okay? But after about 1820 or 30, New Englanders, rural people, started to build a barn that looked a little differently and put the door in the gable end of the barn. So door in the side of the barn to door in the gable end of the barn. There's no real name for this barn. Um, I call it New England uh, barn. Um, uh, farmers don't, don't have a name, geographers, uh, it, because it, it is not unique to New England. So, uh, but for our purposes, there's New England barn, there's an English barn. Those are the two major barns. After 1840, no one else is building um, an English barn. Again, everyone is building barns like this. And this is the barn that they built with connected farms. So, English to New England barn. One of the reasons, and there are many, with ags, you can talk about this forever, but um, this typical New England barn could be extended with with the bents or bays to the rear. So you can get the center one is three bays and you can add four or five, six bays or 20 bays if, if you want over there. Um, and it could be added onto in, as the barn is connected to other buildings. You can't quite do that with the English barn because it doesn't it's add on that easily that way if you have multiple doors and things like that. Anyway, this worked, and it worked in the connected farm organization. And one of the, one of the leading reasons why they chose this barn in the new in the reform nineteenth century. Barns are cool because they they talk about the farming in New England, and you can learn a lot. There's two traditions of agricultural buildings of, of English farmers in New England, and that is um, the large barn, um, or it could be the English or, or the New England barn. Here, and also small outbuildings. The English come over with a tradition of multi-agricultural barns. Pig house, chicken house, uh, ice house, on and on. And, and they do that with a little larger lower barn, and, but they gradually combine it to one barn. Pennsylvania German barn was an example in the, late, in the early 19th century and other influences. They made bigger barns in the 19th century too. So, um, there's a phase of, of, of uh, these coming on strong and, and being built up. Oh, my goodness, you, someone should have um, alerted me to this. I just noticed that, see this barn door? It's offset. There's the center of the barn. And as you know, barn door, if you ask a kid to draw a picture, a picture of a barn, mm -hmm. they know you put it in the center. It's God intended. Okay, just like this barn over here, about 19, 1890 barn or so, or so a little earlier. earlier. Um, what happened here? Perhaps there was a lot of spiritous liquors, as we learned, that was consumed at the raising. And perhaps Josephus, the barn builder, had a little too much and he offset the door, right? Could be. Mistake? Not a mistake. Amaze your friends, because now you know that this is an early version of the of the New England barn with the door in the gable end. You see this bay? This is the bay of the side of the barn with the cattle, and it's smaller. This is usually south facing here because the cattle go down here, and um, it, 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 the cattle are there, then you'd be a little warmer. And the other bay, a little longer, is the hay bay. Hmm, okay. Throughout the 19th century, barns become more standardized. You know, their, their pieces become more standardized uh, Sawn lumber as opposed to hewn. Anyway, all of it. And they become more like this barn with the door in the center. Cows get bigger. People get bigger. Anyway, it, it, it's standardized. And so th you can say this this barn, if I saw this, I would say building date 18, um, 1840 to 1850 or 60, building date 1880 or whatever. So amaze your friends. And you can say, my dear, notice the the earlier English uh, uh, New England barn type because it has a door slightly offset uh, as opposed to this barn down the road that has a, you know the door in the center, and you'd be you'd be pretty good. So I'm you know 
This is you can be a sophisticated born enthusiast, uh, but by saying by saying that that's usually correct. So, um, uh, landmark trust. Uh, this is the Amos Brown farm um, that Jeremy uh, described here, uh, Whittingham, uh, Vermont. This is right near the uh, uh, Massachusetts line and all that. It's a beautiful set uh, of buildings uh, now all painted red. Um, Red is not the usual color. We'll talk about painting a little bit more over there, but um, uh, we're painting uh, this way now. Um, a, a beautiful stand of buildings. Um, it should be familiar to many of you because, I mean, for me, tragically, um, we have a whole lot of connected farms that are missing the big barn. It's fallen down. It's gone to disrepair, and then it's moved out of the way. And you get almost many more connected farms that used to be connected farms to barn that are now looking like this. With the, with the um, Brown Farm, we don't know exactly know where we were doing the research. Um, uh, uh, help Jeremy or find, uh, find the barn location um, uh, if, if he can. Um, it may, barns may have been located across the road uh, over, over here um, uh, or, or connected to, to the barn itself. Um, we don't know that. And I, I mentioned this because there are traditions where the barn is located across the road Sometimes farmers have their best farmland across the road, and this and the well is over there, and et cetera, um, and they put the barn over there. Not a usual tradition, but it's out there as a tradition. There also is also another tradition about barns where you have a field barn. It could be a neighbor's barn, a uh, barn that went west to uh, Indiana, and uh, it, the, they saved the barn, and it, it, it's another crop barn in the field. So different traditions. I'm here to talk about the connected barns and all that. So uh, uh, help us find the location of the Brown uh, Farm barn. And um, uh, I guess Jeremy will give you a prize or, or something like that. Think about that, Jeremy. Um, a lot of things to talk about barns, but we can't do it here. But uh, here now it's the professor again. Uh, it's, I'm asking you a question, OK? And so here we see uh, um, a funny object on, on top of the, uh, the barn, which we call a cupola, right? <laughs> Oh, whoops, that was the untruth button. It just went off. We don't call it a cupola. Okay, why am I? We call it the V word. Anybody out there? Ventilator. Okay, so this is a ventilator. We use this on the top of barns because um, it's made uh, to ventilate um, explosive uh, gases from spontaneous combustion. When you have packed hay of a uh, uh, fresh packed hay, it, it can explode um, in, in, in combustion unless it's vented like this. And if we go backwards to the, um, oops, sorry. Oh, no, we don't have it. I, I was thinking of, of another barn here, sorry. Um, uh, looking for other, other ventilators. Um, um, so uh, this gets put on, on, on top of barns um, in, at 18, after 1820s or, or 30s to vent the increasing amount of hay in fields. So uh, for you architectural enthusiasts, here is a cupola. And and as we're, I'm an architectural historian here, um, the story of the cupola, if you saw it in a house like this, uh, can anyone tell me the story that I'm, I'm trying to repeat over here that's been told to me tens of tens of times? The ship captains, it was done for the ship captain's wives to look out to sea to see the whaling uh, captain coming home, okay? Well, it wasn't done for that. This was done because this is a prominent lawyer in um, Freeport, uh, Maine, or something like that, and he uh, puts it on top because he he's a rich capitalist. Okay, anyway, it's an architectural style and all that. Didn't have to do with ships and boats or anything like that. Or stories we tell about that. This is put on top of the barn because it vents um, uh, a gas. I'm an architect. I can tell you better ways to vent it. And I was looking for a barn. Um, Actually, in Putney, there is a barn, the, the Putney School uh, barn. It has small ventilators across the top. You could have done that, and they knew that, but it wouldn't look as powerful as this, this ventilator. I like that because, you know, farmers are accused of, of always, or they tell themselves of, of always being um, uh, functional and all that, but this isn't being functional. Uh, there's a lot of more modest ways to vent it, but boy, does that look good, okay? I, I would say that, and one of the things you want to know about both of these, uh, the cupola and the ventilator were put onto barns and houses at about the same time, 1820, 18, well, barns ventilators continue into the 20th century um, sometimes too, but they started about the same time. Interesting, they're not related to each other, but they occur, you'll figure it out. 
Wines are cool because their structure is cool and they can make a restaurant with, with making looking good because it has barn wood in it and all that. The barn structure is, is a medieval structure. Um, it's English because these are English farmers and all that, but it occurs all throughout Northern Europe or Northern uh, Europe um, in some way. It's an all wood construction and these timbers are, are held together because a tenon tongue is in a mortise hole and they're, they're held together by wooden pegs or tunnels, uh, older English uh, uh, terminology. Uh, barns are cool also because you can see the structure of the diagonal, the brace. It's a 45 degree angle and it prevents the barn from racking and falling over. It's structure that you can actually understand in some way. So we all like that, I, I think. This is an Oregon barn, but stripped of, of its uh, 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 exterior siding. Um, this is what's underneath uh, barns. Lots to talk about. We can't, we can't do it all here. In Vermont and all over New England, or all over America, <clears throat> they had barn raisins. And the sequence is, and it, why, why it made sense to farmers who are mostly isolated a little bit in the, in the countryside, is that they could work on and build the pieces of the barn into separately, in small scale with one or two people. And then all of a sudden they come together and they have a barn raising. So the farm community comes together. They have a good time with spiritist liquors or whatever, and they do good work. They raise the barn. This is a, new, a Connecticut barn raising uh, about 1900. And I just smile thinking about this. There are hundreds of thousands of barn raisins in New England and in Vermont, a lot of them and all that. And we have one or two pictures, one or two good pictures of that. It's, it must have been like grass growing. Why would you take a picture of that? Anyway, we don't have the pictures, but here is a barn raising. These guys are raising the bent on the barn. They're coming together. Where we do have pictures of barn raising are in some areas like, like because they continue, continued into the 20th century, here's Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania. Um, the German side of my family is from central Pennsylvania. Um, and they have, here's the picture of a barn raising. So here's the big bent being raised in here. These are called pike poles, you know, kind of push uh, that, that big, it's a couple of tons there to raise up in the air. And you have a big uh, celebration, a feast, um, big spread for uh, big farmers, modest takeout food, I, I assume for small farmers. But in all cases, a tremendous day for, for the farm family, uh, a memorable day. When you read the farm diaries, you know, it's chicken and hogs and, and you know, going to market and then all of a sudden the farmer says, born and raised. And you could tell that this is a special day. And it was, but it was also the day to gather and do good work, which is what you do on the farm. Um, lots of things to talk about. Oh, I know, um, for some of you guys in the audience, um, presumably they know a lot about construction. I asked my colleagues in architecture, guys in your structure, why are these guys, these farmers up here on this plant being raised up in the air? Huh? Okay, now the builders answer in technical uh, uh, way that, you know, well, they need to, the mizzen mass needs to hold to the, no, 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 no. The reason why they're up there is this is the, one of the most exciting days of their life and they're having a good time, okay? And uh, the, here's here's the, here's um, Siegfried's wife down here. She's saying, Siegfried, you're gonna bust your head, but he's having a good time and he's up there and they're having a good time and they're raising the barn. I think that's what happened. What happens in barn raising? Another question for for this because it's a quiz now, and so now this is for you women now. This is male and women because you can answer this both the same way. So let's say you're driving down the road and you pass a connected farm. Presumably you know the Smith farm and you and you know that and you're driving by with the kids and they're in the back seat and they say, "Mommy, Daddy, or Grammy, Grampy, who made Smith's barn?" And so, you know, you turn around. Husband or wife, you say, what do you say? What's your answer? Okay, you're supposed to say something here. Okay. You might say Farmer Smith, right? We usually say that. Eh, you know, far, to say he built his farm in a barn, I would say he probably contributed a lot to his barn raising, but he didn't build the barn. The guy who built the barn is a barn raising specialist the master builder or the, the head man or whatever you want to call it. Here's the German 
He's standing here someplace over here who built this barn, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is behind every barn that you know, and behind all houses too, you have a team of builders who aren't the individual farmers. And there's the myth of individual farmers. Do they help? Do they drag the timbers? Yes, yes, they do all that. Do they have the skills to put that notching together? No, 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 they didn't do that. So give them credit. I love this photo over here because it shows a barn building team over there, late 19th century. And I ask you another question. Who is the master builder? Is it builder A, builder B, C, D, or E? Answer? I don't know this, but I know a little bit about this. because I've done barn raisings and things like that and documented them and all. But um, what's this? This is a square. The guy who holds the square is the guy who usually knows the art of the building because you need the square to calculate the, the angles and, and all that sort of thing over there. I'd call him the master builder, who we should give credit for building uh, the barn and all that. I like this because I think he's the heir apprentice and all that. I don't know that. So you know, should, you shouldn't make up stories about historical photos, but sometimes it's okay to do that. <clears throat> farmers, Vermont farmers are often portrayed or portray themselves as stoic, individualistic, you know, and they've done it all, you know, and they've been through it all. And that's that's half true. And that's that's true a lot of times. What they don't usually say is that. We got we got help. <laughs> we we have a tradition of I call it mutuality. You can just say, you know, sensibly working together about certain things. If you read farm diaries, one of the most common quotations that you will um, read, it's over and over again. In every diary that I've read is something like this. Here's farmer, farmer Smith that we just saw over here. And he writes in his diary, um, Josephus Blake comes over to my place in the morning and we shear sheep. There's a little sheepy down there if you can't see it over there and they're, they're shearing in, in the morning. And in the afternoon, we go over to Blake's place and we shear sheep. And sometimes they'll just say, after you just know the diary enough, you know, they'll say, I changed work with Blake and we shared sheep or something like that. The word is changing. Um, it's English exchanging and all that. Um, and it comes over and over in the diaries. They teamed up to do that. They also team up over and over again in the winter. And this will be, I'll tell you more about this in just a second, but you don't want to do do uh wood hauling in the winter alone. I think you, it's a good way to be a uh the good way to die. Um, and so uh, Vermont farmers and other parts of New England uh, work together uh, to, to do a, a major uh, cash uh, crop uh, in, in the woods, and they did that together. Barn raisings, of course. The traditions of women are hardly photographed and all that, so we don't have uh, the husking bee and, and getting together to do um, chores and things like that. There's also the tradition, a powerful one for every farmer, and that is in times of trouble and, and, and tragedy and sickness and childbirth um, and death, we get together. There's no Republicans, Democrats. It's, you know, the farm community. It, it's a great tradition. It's your tradition. So um, I, I wish we'd celebrate it a little bit more. It, it, it's, um, uh, you still do in many ways, but, but this is part of your people. Great. Other things. And although I downplay the snow theory, there's one way that the connected farm works. And that is that often a, a line of buildings is either lined this way or in an L-shaped form or various ways to prevent northern winds to uh, pile up and to and also allow the sun to dry out the dooryard. There's two yards, if you want to think about that, on, on the connected farm. The dooryard for people and wagons and all that and the barnyard for animals. So city folks have to be explained about that. But if your dooryard is wet into the spring with snow and on the northern side of your, like the northern side of your building, you lose a week uh, because you can't get your wet, you're gone. New England farmers have a short growing season and they couldn't shorten it any more by having a dooryard that's mucked up or something like that. Anyway, the connected farm organization is, is a way to prevent that. It works well that way. I will say then, however, the people who really needed this much more, people in uh, Minnesota, uh, uh, Norwegian bachelor farmers, those, those kind of folk, um, 
uh, they never connected their ho house and their barns together. So we have to downplay a little bit this as as the major uh, reasons to make connected connected farms. I'm an architect. Um, I give architectural tours here in Portland and all that, and uh, I know the Queen Anne, and I can tell you the 15 shades of Queen Anne, and I can tell you the architectural styles of these buildings here. Now, the, and I'm going to just do a sidebar here. I could show you pictures of of building of connected farms that are of in the towns, and so I would call them connected house to stables. So it's a house to little house, big house, back house, stable. Now, in, in the New England villages, um, the stable is also a barn, too, because in the villages you had a cow and, and chickens and things like that, too. But still, you could be a, a merchant or a, 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 a worker in a mill or something like that and have this kind of building. So anyway, architectural tour, we have a federal style connected farm, a Greek revival with some Italian age feature connected farm. Aren't you getting excited here? Um, we have um, another Italian age example with a cupola, uh, two cupolas here. Um, uh, Second Empire, Frenchy, uh, kind of connected uh, house to stable. Uh, Gothic, boy, wrong color, but it's a, it's a Gothic connected uh, farm and a, a shingle style uh, connected farms. I can tell some of you are very excited because I, know, I love this stuff. But New England farmers and Vermont farmers also did not usually build in these elaborate styles. People in the city did, people with more wealth and often did, but not average farmers usually. I won't say they didn't, but 80% of, uh, of people, they built in another way. They built in a way that was hard to, do. we don't have names for it. The architectural style of this, most people would say Greek revival, but you could say Georgian federal Greek revival. It's kind of the holy trinity of uh, uh, the styles of neoclassical styles that the farmers built. But generally, most farmers adopted a neoclassical style of the white building. I would call it New England village style, white and all that. And it has modest classical details. So there's a modest column that could be from Greece or Rome. And the return is always there. You can just see it there. The roof comes down and it returns this way. Part of a Greek revival uh, kind of detail. So it's there, but in a very modest way. This is what most farmers used. Uh, to decorate their farms. Now, that's true, and so, but some of you could say, yes, but they didn't know any better. <laughs> wow. Okay. I have, a, I have a farmer superstar in my book. If you read my book in the last couple of chapters, I, I say, here's, here's um, uh, uh, the, uh, the farmer, um, the Walker farmer uh, that, that is in the final chapter, and he goes by this house probably 300 times in his life or more and all that. And this is a kind of famous house that you might know. If you've ever gone to um, Kennebunk, I used to live in Kennebunk, uh, uh, you bypass this house called the Wedding Cake House on the way to the Paw to see the bushes and all that sort of thing. Okay, well, Bias, my, my farmer, did that. So he knew about other styles. I know he knew it. He went to Boston and he knew about other styles and all that. And this is an Italianate style, uh, uh, Italian Gothic. And so it's Milan Cathedral, if you're there. He didn't build his house this way, and neither did any other farmer. So it isn't that they didn't know about that. I think they chose another kind of architecture, in this classical vernacular, that's what I would call it, over and over again, through 100 years or more um, into the 20th century. Interesting aesthetic uh, kinds of choices for interesting reasons. So I'm back again. Are you still convinced? Are you some of you some of you city folks? I know it's hard, it's hard to not to uh, to get to rid of that. You know to say that they really did it to be a house and barn in in the winter. Um, for some of you city folks, by the way, I would want to say, have you ever followed a Vermont farmer around in the in the winter? I have to say, uh, I've done this more with New Hampshire and Maine farmers uh, uh, over here, but I've done that. Okay. Do you think those guys needed? safe passage to the barn. I mean, if you know what they do in the winter, they're out in the, in the snow every every winter's day or their life and all that. And they're in colder weather. You know, they're we wearing this light jacket. I'm, I'm in my uh, uh, Arctic uh, gear and all that. I'm frozen to death and all. But okay. they didn't need it for lots of reasons that you think if you if you still do that. Another example, just here in the sidebar down here, this is the farmers in Aroostook County. They had a lot of reasons to connect together, in, but they never did. 
they do their farms later, and that's why they never can chose to the farms. Also, they had one cash crop. You're going to hear about that in just a second. Potatoes. And and so that they didn't do connected farms there. So if you're surprised about where connected farms are, um, that's we'll talk about that in just a second. But one way to explain that, what where they are, is this is English people. And and that's important. Okay. And so the, here's uh why it's important is uh well here's the here's this other map over here. This is the same map here, but it's densities. Here we are um in, in, in Putney down here and all that. And you see what I'm saying here is 20 to 40 percent of farms you know, ever um were connected. Maybe it's a little higher proportion in, in, in Putney and all that. And and it gets there's a more, more denser area of connected farms over here. But in any case, this Connected farms are done by English people. Now, I just, uh, some of you, I don't know, just sort of sit back and say, well, so what? Yeah. Well, um, in America, I, I just went to a day for a lecture in Iowa, okay? And if you go down the road in Iowa, passing lots of farms, there's a Swedish farmer next to next to an um, Irish farmer, next to a German farmer, and they, they have tradition. It's all over the place. Traditions combined in, in other places and all that. But nobody has this kind of density of unity in this large area over here of, of a single uh, ethnic folk. And that's, you know, we don't think of ourselves, the English folks in that way, but but it is. I, I, I know the French come down, but but they're not farmers and, and they don't do it until way later. Polish people come up to Connecticut Valley, but that's way late. They're English. Not only that, they're English from the similar counties in England. Oh, so this is the uh, argument of cultural similarity, which they are. And if an idea takes off, it might make sense to similar people with similar ideas, religious backgrounds, and things like that. Just, just, just saying. Yeah, put, put that, uh, put that away, and think about it. I've done my homework, and I've looked in New England along with other scholars, and we couldn't find connected farms before 1840 or so. Some of you could be a little skeptical about, you know, farmers built outbuildings and all, all over the place. But before 1830, there are no connected farms. Nobody has suggested that they're out there. This is a famous painting, Morning, Morning in Blue Hill Village, Jonathan Fisher, 1824. He's a minister. He's cool. He paints, plays musical instruments. And when he paints, he never does a connected farm, nor anybody else. They're not out there. So why during this 50-year period, 50 years, did they build connected farms? Uh, just as a side note here, there are some other buildings that are connected in this style that we have to acknowledge. And here is a Beverly, Massachusetts painting over here. There's a house and here's their stable. This is Kenny Buck, um, uh, Kenny Buck, Maine. And this is a, a, a well-to-do uh, federal star, late federal star, Georgian Greek revival house and added to a large stable over here. There is this type of building. We usually associated with European manorial estates, Palladian, we call them. That's Palladio, the architect. Um, there are pattern books that said you could, you know, arrange the landscape. Mount Vernon and Monticello are connected farms, if you think about it that way. And that was in the air for wealthy folks. Average farmers looked at this and said, huh, yeah, wealthy folks, you know, wealthy folks, they do a lot of schooly things. And, and that's out there. They didn't copy that. So I just want to say that. So now I ask the question, why did Northern New England farmers connect their houses and their barns? Now, um, Jeremy, um, do you have a, a drum roll, a, a little trumpets you can play in the background? Uh, to talk of you know, multiple reasons. I'm going to give you the reason that they made connected farms, and it's going to be short and quick and decisive, okay? Okay, are you ready? Jeremy, Jeremy, did did you did, did you rearrange my slides? I mean, I asked for the reason that what this is Minnesota, this is Kansas. Why, 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 why would you? Well, Minnesota and Kansas. What? Let's unpack this a little bit. I think this is the this is one of the this is the answer, and then New Englanders are going to recoil from this, and they're going to do something else. So this is part of the answer. This is wheat. This is Minnesota. This is chaff. You know, this is the excess of wheat and all that. There's a date that you should remember about wheat uh, coming from Minnesota and other places um, uh, and all. And that's um, 1825. 
any of historians out there want to, there's a lot of things happening there, but what's the one crucial one for farmers in New England? The crucial one, the sword uh, is, the, is out there. The Erie Canal is made. 10 years after the Erie Canal is, is made, I haven't studied you guys, but where you shipped your, used to ship your wheat, your major cash crop in 1835, you guys were, were cut out of that market. You couldn't compete with Ohio wheat after 1835 or so. In other words, the major cash crop that you guys had that had that had sustained English farmers for ever since William the Conqueror, or Adam and Eve even, or something like that, you had wheat, you couldn't grow it. You could go out to make your own bread, good luck, but you couldn't make money on it. Cash crop. Okay, here's corn, okay? This is more corn out of two fields in, in Kansas than Putney farmers could ever grow in, I don't know, a year or two years or whatever, okay? Are you going to compete? How are you going to compete? Who are you going to call? Are you going to give up? Some people did. But others, they didn't. You know, you could give up or you could be a Vermont farmer and dig in. And they did. And so what they did in, in the teeth of this competition, which only got worse, first they get knocked out of wheat and, uh, and then corn and, and it goes down the list. They tried to go single crop. To, to make, you know, uh, because your 19th century, increasing tools, the, the, no longer subsistent farm, you couldn't make it. Um, hand uh, 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 winnowing uh, doesn't make it in, in the teeth of, of, of mowers and things like that, which you gradually needed. What are you going to do? You develop a system of farming that nobody else was recommending, but you guys did it. Mixed farming and home industry. So, you always grow a lot of things and all that, but you really had to do that. And nobody else in the country is continuing to do this after you guys did. And you and you did it. Mixed farming, and most of you can understand. It's growing tomatoes, I'm sorry, it's growing wheat and and chickens and and uh, eggs and uh all, all the crops that that, that you apples and and uh, sugar maple and uh, maple syrup and things like that. But you also needed another income somehow. I, I follow farmers throughout New England. And the thing that I know is that if you look at the farm ledger sheet uh, about their, their income, most farmers who succeeded had other income besides farming crops. They had timber. And, they had, and I love this picture in here because here's four different farmers, and they're working on double handles probably in the early spring over here um, to ship off to a mill in, in Monocket or who knows, someplace uh, and over there. Do you see the, the handle and all of that? A cash crop. You had to do that. Farmers in the other, other part of the country aren't doing that. In Iowa, in 1840, competing here, they started hogs and corn. What do you think they're doing today? Hogs and corn. You couldn't do that. You never could. You got knocked out. What are you going to do? You developed mixed farming and home industry. And for a while, you succeeded against all odds. So what you did is you manufactured uh, lots of things within your back house, uh, usually uh, lots of home operations over there. And here's one, a little more spectacular. But anyway, this is a Kenny Bunk farmer. Here, here he is. Here's his proud daughters and wife are over there. I mean, this is Maida and the wife over there. And he's proud over there because over here is a carriage, and he made, made this carriage in this back house building uh, that he has over there. Here's an English barn. Um, over and over again, we see farmers diversifying this way. Wives do shoe leathers and things like that. Farmers in other parts of the country do diversify and all this, but not like this. And you had to do this, or you, you couldn't survive. You could go west and all that. Or you could retool like this, and you did. I have farm journals. I've read them more in Maine than any other place. And so the journal, the people in the farm journals were cautious to recommend connected farms because they knew nobody else in the country was doing this. And they knew connected farms were starting to be built because it was it, it was a good way to house this operation. So in a journal, a popular journal, Maine journal, it said, a view of a model farm buildings for a Maine farmer. And the article goes on to say, Farmer Smith, should your 
bar, should your existing buildings be organized so that your house and your barn could be located or are located slightly close together, you could find it convenient to connect them together with the house and the barn to make a more efficient farm operation. Well, good advice. He, he captures this, he captions this with, by a Maine farmer's wife. Huh. That's hardly ever done in an Aggie magazine for Maine farmers, but it was here because it wasn't the popular recommendation. These, far, these agriculturalists who made this magazine, they knew that. They knew connected farms, but they knew that it was also the way that Maine farmers had to go, despite farmers in every other part of the country that were anywhere, anywhere close to this. You had to do this, and they did it. So it was a reasonably fashionable and economically viable and fashionable uh, way to do that, and they recommended it, and they did it. They did it for survival, if you want to think about that, because there wasn't any other way. This is the only way they could farm. Guess what? The connected farm is housed really, really well in a connected, uh, the, uh, the farming operation uh, is housed really well in a connected farm. So they whitened, straightened, and cleaned up the landscape in New England and reformed in the normal way that farmers did. And they made connected farms because that was the sign of, of viable, technologically advanced farming, even though it doesn't seem that way today. And you guys built. Huh. And no different than uh, uh, tenacious, tenaciously um, than any other part of the country. But uh, here's an L that goes on forever. Here's a barn, you know, probably 12 bays or something like that, whatever. You built, you built, uh, you continue to build to house this agricultural operation. Some of you could stand back now and say, well, yeah, this is, they built big buildings like this, but gee, could average farmers do this? No. Um, not the big barns, the farms that I was showing you, but average farmers could do this. They could rearrange their buildings to a connected farm by simply moving existing buildings into line and developing a connected farm. We don't have a lot of pictures of this. This is a 20th century movement because here we see horses and ox teams here, but they're dragging their old schoolhouse across to a different location. Hundreds and thousands, I can say millions of movement of buildings were done by farmers. If your city folk, it seems spectacular. These are farmers who drag wood around in the winter every winter's day of their life. You know, this, moving a building is, is a piece of cake. You know, uh, no foundation bolts, no plumbing. You know, they can do this easily. A typical farm diary that, I recur uh, that I've seen over and over again is, Farmer Smith says, my, my son, Josephus, he goes over to the Smith place with our ox team in order to build, move Smith's barn, you know, across the road to his house or something like that. Over and over. They could do that. Piece of cake. And they did it. I like this one because it shows the tenacity of building movement and, and, and making uh, houses, uh, connected houses um, in, in New England. This is Bethel, Maine. This is a you know, nice main town near, near the you know, border of New Hampshire uh, in the north. This is this is a um, Cape Cod house. Here's the doorway. Here's two windows on one side, two windows on the other. Here's the side of, of this connected house. Uh, this sorry, this Cape Cod house over here, and this house is up in the air and it's on cribbing. Cribbing is railway ties, okay. And if you have railway ties like this, and if you have a little small jack that, that they had, it was it's, it's no bigger than eight inches high, um, uh, that you could. Uh, raised uh, 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 timbers with over there, they could raise a house in the air like this. So here's your here's your Cape Cod house. It's 12 feet in the air over here. Here's a guy in the wagon. Here's a guy down below over here. So keep your eye on this Cape Cod house, 12 feet in the air. There it is, 12 feet in the air. And underneath it, we built a cool Victorian parlor, a staircase and all that. We don't usually do this house this way, but it, it gives a spectacular uh, dining room, I imagine, over here with a high ceiling. Um, usually, house expansion like this will be done by um, uh, raising the roof, another expression. But, but And you take off the roof on top, and you add a second floor. But here they did a little, a little differently over there, over and over again. This is a kind of Yankee, a kind of cooling technology, a kind of technological vernacular. Lots of historians who, who who look at culture will talk about that. A machining kind of people uh, are New Englanders um, uh, in other parts of the country too. But 
also in New England, big time. It's just reflected in these, these building experiments. So um, in partial conclusion here, um, they made these buildings because it housed their agricultural operation of mixed farming and home industry um, that they were back to the wall to do, and you couldn't do anything else to make it. And for a while, because it housed uh, this uh, operation in the connected farm, and for a while they succeeded. And it was this was the shape of modern farming in, nor in North and New England uh, during this 50 year period, and they chose it. They chose to reform, as they chose to reform all aspects of their life. So the connected uh, farm of uh, you know, house to barn passage, they, a farmer may have gone there in an old age, uh, limped into the barn uh, in the shelter and all that, but it wasn't the reason they, they made. They made it to reform. They made it to make it in farming, although it seems a little odd to us now. This is why I think you can see that average farmers, you know, asked about this, you know, can't go through the uh, 30 minute answer uh, as I've done, look, citing all those factors there. And it's also a difficult story. I've interviewed um, uh, steel workers in the shadow of their abandoned mills in Ohio. And that's a hard story because you're talking about abandonment of a way of life. And farming is not just a job, it's a way of life. So telling the story of this final abandonment of this style is a difficult story. I would rather tell a story to tourists about the snow and they're happy and you're happy and all that. And I don't make to mean light of that because real farmers tell that story, even though you know, their fathers or grandfathers uh, uh, moved to the buildings into line for, for other, other kinds of reasons, I think. So uh, it's a great story, uh, but the real story is even greater a story to survive, and these guys did survive. These are guys, you know, on their hard, rocky hillsides, you know, give up, go to Ohio. You know, they, they didn't give up at Gettysburg. They didn't give up at uh, Petitum. Uh, they stood their ground. Here they stood their ground, too. They made great architecture. So I, that's, I give you 50 years dominantly, but this is like, and the other part of the story is this. Into the connected, I'm sorry, into the 20th century, they made, um, they finally found a cash crop, a cash source that they could use to be a single crop to make it in farming. So, what could that be? If you're a Vermonter, it's pretty easy. They got milk. <laughs> so, here's some Holsteins. You have a Holstein tradition here in. Um, Putney, I don't know that. I should. I um, should be an ag, but I'm. I don't know that. But find out about that. Isn't Holstein beautiful? It's just a beautiful little cat. Uh, um, they found milk. Your first milk production that you you can ship milk to Boston and other places. 1890, you got you start that. But by 1900, throughout New England, I would just as generalize. If you see a farm that has succeeded, you know, into the 20th century, it probably went to milk. 90 percent did. Um, in some form, making cheese and, and butter first, but then bulk production took over every way. You guys live in an agricultural area, the Connecticut Valley, that is, well, unique in, in Vermont, <laughs> the hill of Vermont, the, it's fl the flat flood plains of, of the valley. You still have your biggest, finest dairy farms in this area, both sides of the river of Vermont and New Hampshire over there. And I would just say to you, in those areas, you want to live in a connected farm if you're a farmer? <laughs> No, if you have a hundred head of cattle, you want to live in a connected farm. Do you see what I'm growing here? You know, you got a pile of manure that's as big as your house. Anyway, connected farm doesn't work with a hundred head. It does work with three or four cows and 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 pigs and and corn and, and things like that. You see how that does. So these guys didn't go connected farm. Your big your big farms in your area, um, and that's why they didn't build connected farms. But people previous to that, they did. You have a you have architecture here that is unique. It's unique also, and the one way that I wanted to emphasize here as an architect, and I, I emphasize things like this, because the art, they put the architectural style of the house onto the whole complex, including the barn. Now, the farmers I talked to in Iowa, they kind of look and say, well, you know, it doesn't seem quite right. They don't say this words, but they think this, to put the architectural style of the house on the barn. You know, if you have a house and you paint it white or whatever, you paint the barn red to differentiate. But you didn't do that in New England. 
Do you see how this, there's a scale here that I think is typical and, and, and is appropriate to the choice they made to make connected farms as a unified complex there uh, together, whatever the reasons, you know, you don't have to uh, listen to the architectural professor, they did that. And other farmers in the other parts of the country did not do that. And this is why more than the connected house to barn connection, I would say it's the stylistic features of the unified composition that makes this unique. It's beautiful architecture. I'm an architect. I love this building over here. Um, uh, it's, I, I'm an architect, this is a beautiful building. There is an expression. Farmers don't use the word beautiful, by the way. This is a city folk aesthetic terminology that guys like me would use. Late 19th century, they, they used the term a good stand of buildings. I suppose you're saying it's beautiful, which working class or farmers, you know, they don't, they don't go that route and all that. But it is a good stand of buildings. It is beautiful. And they made that. Um, it's also part of an architecture that individual farmers make themselves. So the, the, the pattern is there of the buildings, but you can see how by arranging the building in different formats, this is the design of individual farmers, husband and wife uh, together. And although farmers in other parts of the country really arrange the location of buildings, house to barn, not, it's nothing like this in the way that you've done here. I would say it's an example of, of okay, I, the words don't come, there's no words. Folk architecture. I don't like to use the word folk. These are modern farmers and all that. So I'm befuddled here about how to do that to give you guys credit for that without using you know professor terms to do that. Because usually we, we talk about folk architecture as you know folk art. Folk art is usually done by unique people in the society and all that. But if you talk to artists and all that, they're they're, they're on the edge some usually somehow. This is average farmers making great architecture. So whatever you want to call it, it's it's your tradition. It's a beautiful tradition uh, that you have. Last two slides, hope I'm not over too much. This is a farmer in, in Bethel, Maine. Uh, we know a little bit about it, some things we do inside, but it's typical, okay? He inherits a Cape Cod house. He rips out that horrible chimney with, with, with fireplaces in it, oh my God, and puts a stove. He's modernizing. He takes out these horrible nine over six windows. I hope there's some antique dealers in the audience here. Oh, my God. And puts it in the chicken coop probably over here and, and installs modern two over two windows. You see, he's modernizing. Inside, it's the same thing that I've told you about. He built, he takes down the old English barn and builds this barn here. And then at some point, about plus or minus the Civil War, he takes this building here from some place drags it into line and connects his kitchen with his barn and he's a modern farmer. He makes a connected farm. He plants sugar trees and sugar maple out in front. That's cool. You know, here he's in a proud picture. And what he does that you don't see, you see this? What's this? The rocks, okay? Now I ask you, this is another professor question. Have you ever seen a Vermont farm with rocks in the dooryard. This is, you could call this the dooryard over here. The answer is no, never. <laughs> there were rocks there, but they're gone. There's a tenacity about this. Here's a quote from Tobias Walker. Um, I love it about this tenacity about rocks. You know, it's about you, you, your Vermont farmers facing the rocks. What are you going to do? In his diary, he writes, oh, this is about 18, no, this is what I was saying, 1910 or something like that. Uh, no, 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 1900, um, Edwin writes, my, uh, no, uh, Tobias writes, my son and I, Edwin, go down to the lower fields um, and we, we remove rocks that my grandfather and father had plowed around for a hundred years. <laughs> they didn't have to remove those rocks. His father and his grandfather removed them. It's in... They were reforming, you know, and we're, you you have to, I understand that from removing rocks and fields in Maine and all that, a little bit and all that. You got to remove them. It's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle. They did that. It's beautiful. Last slide. We don't have pictures of average farmers that, that are uh, relaxed or normal. It's all set up or they're all, and like I said, like I showed, uh, they're dressed up or something like that. So finally, one of the stories uh, that we is always told in some ways about the Vermont farm or New Hampshire or Maine 
um, is that there's those who stayed and those who had to go or went, okay? You can tell who's gonna go. You can tell who's gonna stay, okay? These are your, if these are your people, it's a great story. And um, those who stayed, they dug in, they could have went, they could have given up, they didn't. And the farming path they chose that was, was, was not chosen by other people, but was the only path that they could choose to maintain farming. They made beautiful buildings. Why don't you guys preserve them? They're great. Uh, they're part of your culture. Thank you. Cheers.